Having people having vocational training, having a full year of apprenticeship in uh, enterprises, this is the one thing. Um, as far as the primary and secondary um, education, there are several uh, small projects and uh, um, the ministry tends to have uh, seminars for, um, uh, for the teachers. And uh, I can't recall if I re if I remember forgetting something. Oh yeah. And uh, the last thing is that uh, in the higher education, there is a tent now in uh, uh, reinforcing science uh, and uh, research in science, especially in applied projects that are feasible and uh, have um, hands, apart from the hands-on experience, that can have um, a feasible um, combination and a viable combination with enterprises. Thank you. So it seems as though, as part of the conversation, we are already alluding to this, but, um, and, and indeed some examples have been mentioned already, but, but is it fair to suggest that there is an increase, this reflects as well on, on some of um, Todd's presentation, that there's an increasing shift in pedagogy from teachers being a source of knowledge to teachers being facilitators of learning, especially in, in this age of a huge amount of often unverified information on, in places such as Wikipedia? Well, uh, I think actually you gave me a very good lead. And uh, <laughs> I think this is actually how we are discussing the, the new pedagogy. Uh, looking more into ourselves as, first of all, peers with uh, our students, into going into peer learning, working with them as facilitators, as mentors, as uh, starting points, as advisors, but also as uh, co-creators uh, with them. Not providing the answers and the solutions, but working with them into formulating interesting big questions, new challenges, and find, trying to find together our own discoveries. So also we are trying to introduce also peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, not only between, let's say, teachers or invited mentors from uh, other science sectors or from the business or from the startups or from uh, the tech industry or, and so on, but also we are introducing the idea of uh, the mentorship between students to students and also students to us. So uh, we enter a new, let's say, uh, network, we form a network of peers that somehow we enable each other into working into the same direction. And uh, at least for me and with my colleagues that we're working in this direction, this is the most interesting path that we are trying to discover and learn from, from it. Uh, I think it's a very interesting point because um, right now everybody needs to uh, move to this uh, uh, side to be a facilitator, especially to be able to explain how to evaluate information. Uh, students come to the class having read uh, all sorts of uh, uh, information in uh, websites and uh, uh, sometimes uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you ask uh, how did you come up with this idea and it's, uh, the answer is from I read it in the web. Uh, okay, but is it uh, a valid uh, source of information? And uh, they don't know it's wrong. Uh, yes, but it's in the web, <laughs> you know. So uh, this is especially important for younger uh, students, I think, because now they are uh, they are multitask. They can uh, read uh, two or three. They can do two or three more things at the same time, texting in their mobile phone while they are uh, reading something else. So it's a, a traditional way of uh, teaching. I think it's uh, almost over uh, at this point. Uh, uh, I have uh, some mind uh, maps in my slides that I show to the students. Uh, 
Uh, the first year that I did that, about seven years ago, they didn't know what this is, the mind map. Mm -hmm. Now, they, yesterday, they look at it and they were able to explain to me what this uh, mind map was showing because they are used to getting a lot of information at the same time and be able to uh, understand it. So it's um, really, we, we need to move on uh, to a new way of teaching. Uh, including this aspect in our teaching. Would you, would you go uh, more into saying uh, teaching or learning? Because this is also an, uh, a question of, of how we introduce what we are doing. Moving from teaching to, to a learning approach, which is wider for us. Thank you. Difficult. <laughs> Um, here, my input would be based on the roundtables that I've seen um, during the last two years uh, for which we've been trying to push uh, general education reform. And exactly, uh, these are the main topics that have come out, that we need to change the didactics, but how to reconcile that with the material which needs to be taught? And how do we incorporate blended learning and where do we begin with fostering um, inquisitive-based approaches to science? Um, so these are very, very tough questions, and I believe all educational systems at this point are actually challenging, uh, challenging them. Let me uh, return back to uh, one of the highlights that I made earlier. Uh, of course, there is a shift, and there should be, a must be a shift from uh, the uh, classic way of teaching to more uh, facilitating mentor way of uh, teaching. Uh, but at the same time, we need to, to, to make this shift happen also, not only with the teachers, but also with the parents. Parent teachers should work together with parents and uh, kids, not only with kids, mentoring them uh, and uh, facilitating their uh, uh, drive for uh, more science. And uh, just to uh, return back to what uh, Tim uh, initially asked about uh, the formal training of teachers in improving their STEM qualifications. Actually, we do have uh, such questions in our survey, and the result shows that 51% uh, of all the teachers that we surveyed across the seven countries uh, have passed uh, more than three times uh, through this kind, of, through some kind of formal training on the job on science or teaching science. Of course, there are uh, differences across the countries, and uh, the leading countries with uh, more frequent uh, training for teachers on the job, uh, how to teach science. Uh, uh, um, the leading countries uh, are Germany, uh, uh, with 44 percent of the teachers uh, passing more than three times through the, this kind of training. Uh, uh, um, Portugal, 45 percent, uh, Greece, uh, 42 percent, and so on. And uh, the, the countries that lead behind are uh, lag behind uh, Bulgaria, unfortunately, only with 21 percent, and uh, Serbia with uh, 27 percent of the teachers. So well, let's try and tie some of those points together, then. Some of the points you've made and something that uh, Toto was just um, alluding to. If we are in the midst of a shift in pedagogy, and we're trying to reconcile that shift in pedagogy with material that needs to be taught, what, what systems do we have to, to recognize good content? So how do we judge what is good content? And perhaps just as importantly, how do we evaluate its applicability to industry, to real life STEM careers? I've just thought of that question. I thought it was wonderful. But anyway, please. <laughs> um, let's, let's take things in a different order. So I think, um, I think Anna-Marie, you were keen to step in there, weren't you? You seemed so. It's a very good question. I, one of those one million dollar or four million dollar questions. Um, how do we judge good content? Well, traditionally, we've relied on 
assessments such as PISA or TIMSS, as well as on national uh, standardized examinations to try and understand on a population level um, what are we achieving, um, or even on a global level to try and find our peers. But um, I'm not sure that this is exactly the, the, the right approach for this specific uh, question because um, measuring outcomes, uh, especially when we are talk talking about didactics, we, we know that the number of factors which go into a, the equation of what the outcome is is far too large to be able for us to assess by ourselves what this innovation is doing. Uh, and I, I, and this is not a compliment, I'm serious. Uh, I think this is why this project is so valuable. I really believe that it, 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 ha it holds great value, especially the way that it is structured. Um, we need um, a lot of conferences and a lot of debates, policy debates, practitioner debates, are centered nowadays around innovation and how do we innovate, what do we innovate, how do we assess. And it's a little bit like a lot of talking and no action. Mm, of course, national policy institutions need to support, but they also, on the other hand, face the challenge of, do we experiment with children? Not only is it unethical, but how do we communicate that? So, um, attempting something on a large scale, such as this study, and going through a very rigorous process of trying to understand where the bottlenecks are and what alternative solutions were, and trying to test them through, international, through the international workshops, I think it will produce a very, very interesting set of, uh, of results. I probably trailed off, for which I apologize, but if there's any other question. Just a short comment. If you ask, for example, which are the two ultimate sources for university students for science and technology learning materials, probably 99% uh, will tell you Coursera and MIT Courseware. Mm -hmm. These are the two points of departure, let's say, for everyone. And if you ask primary and secondary school people the same question, they do not, will be not able to, to show this, such kind of two ultimate sources. There are hundreds and thousands of sources for primary and secondary schools, but still there is not even a single one which is really a global and uh, with high quality and so on. And if you look, for example, in MIT courseware, and you look at the um, uh, online courses available there, first of all, you will see that about 70% of the uh, courses are prepared not by, let's say, academic professionals, but by professors that are working in the industry or with the industry. And at the same time, if you look at the statistics about the people who attend the online courses, not only reading what is there, but attend the real online courses, you'll see that more than 55% of the attending these online courses are coming from the industry. So this is why this is the ultimate source. And if we are able to collect the, um, the uh, available online sources or classes or courses for primary and secondary schools, available online from all over the uh, world and produce some kind of this uh, single point of departure with really high quality courses, uh, uh, science based and so on, that are recognized by the industry as really high quality, then uh, this will be, uh, I think, one of uh, very big success. Uh, actually, I will work with both uh, our, uh, let's see, propositions that actually um, I fully agree. First of all, that there are many 
let's, let's say, uh, initiatives and uh, official, uh, official procedures how to provide the, uh, valid curricula and valid resources. But I think this, again, this approach firebacks. Fireback, because uh, actually uh, we have these new, let's say, startup disruptive uh, models that actually they address the new challenges in your ways. As long as the public sector tries to to find and to research for the new models for the future to be, the future is here with us. So I think maybe one of the best approaches is to go with the flow, meaning what? Having many different collaborating nodes within the hubs who are collaborating and are co-curating and co-evaluating on the go the resources, uh, the new models of uh, resources of learning, of collaborating, and then building on them. Maybe we have many roads, not just one resource and again i would like to make also a comment regarding you know in communication at least it's very common that we have moved moved from the push policies and approach to pull so here that's what we are doing we are pulling the, our own resources and uh, our own content and everything so maybe even in the policy making in terms of ministries or uh, whoever is a policy maker we should move to how we have interesting platforms, content, and uh, uh, global and local co-curators for us to pull actually the content and the resources we think are more interesting and valuable to us as educators, as learners, as students, as parents, uh, whatever. And then this is, I think, how we could move to this uh, new citizenship model that includes everything. And then this is how actually we will be really engaging into decision making in all at all levels this is how i can understand it thank you thank you well i agree to the points made earlier related to uh, university education but uh, related to the secondary level education i'm more conservative i believe that um, teaching basic science in uh, the secondary level is uh, very important because the uh, we don't want to make professionals coming out from the secondary level, but we want to make uh, individuals that uh, have uh, some basic uh, knowledge on science and have a way of thinking that is based on these courses. So uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, secondary level uh, education should be more uh, concrete, let's say. And, uh, going to the university, then uh, start uh, looking for uh, professional uh, uh, knowledge and uh, industry-related knowledge. Okay, so thank you for those points. Um, I think now is an opportunity. I've got plenty more questions and could selfishly indulge myself because I am up here, but I won't. I think this is a nice opportunity to get some um, more comments and questions from the audience. Um, so please feel free to raise your hands. Um, isn't there a contradiction between what is valid concerning teachers' work by the ministries, that is, the outcomes of uh, students in the exams and the exams themselves that uh, test knowledge but mostly what is written in books and what teachers tell them and isn't there a contradiction between that and what we very much believe in that is having students uh, think about the questions and uh, asking their own questions finding out um, possible answers and all that. So, how do teachers um, handle this contradiction in their daily work? Thank you. I think that alludes to the, the introductory comments I made about um, policymakers relying on you know, noting that STEM industries are increasingly valuable to economic growth but rely on education systems that don't allow the creativity and innovation and curiosity that, that STEM careers require. So um, on that point, and, and 
please shout out if I'm misinterpreting your question entirely. Um, I wonder if universities and employers are getting students with the skills that they need. No. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem is they, uh, they don't learn how to think uh, independently. That's uh, the main uh, problem uh, when they come to university. They don't know where the water they drink comes from. So it's not in the curriculum. They, they never thought about asking such questions, everyday life questions. So that's my main uh, complaint <laughs> every year. <laughs> If I may actually respond to both questions, <clears throat> first yours, I think that there is a conflict and there is a realization, at least in Bulgaria, there is a realization because uh, the criteria upon which individuals, uh, teachers are assessed, sometimes are too narrow to actually capture the whole range of skills which a teacher is expected to deliver or to, to impart on a student uh, and I think this is one of the challenges and it is actually being addressed probably never fully but at least partially. The only solution I see is to really think about integrated measures, not a single test, not an annual test, but really think about outcomes and think about Never forget about the individual factor. It's not only that we can't speak about a single student, we can't speak about uh, a single class. We must think about um, what we call in economics a multi-level model. We have the community, we have the school, we have the class, we have the teacher, we have the pupil. And the question is what happens with this entire cohort? How are the students performing related to one another? How are the schools performing? What happens with them further on in life? So um, I do think that it can be addressed because more and more nowadays, uh, big data is becoming very fashionable. But the truth is that we already have all of that data. We just need to work in more analytics into analyzing. And I fully agree with you that unless teachers get uh, recognized for not only knowing the number, but knowing how to get to the number, of course, success will be limited. And yeah, I've been, I'm, my ears are like this from hearing from industry that schools are not doing enough. And I, you know what I say? And what did you do? <laughs>